Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our second um, BMSG panel. Uh, we've got some uh, really exciting uh, panelists for us today, and what we're going to try and do with this panel uh, is um, also have some breakout groups where we have more of an opportunity for people to uh, join and express their views about uh, uh, the points under discussion today. So the first panel, for those of you who were there, was really about the historical construction of inequalities in our research. Uh, and the, this second panel today is really what we want to do is think about the barriers to inclusion. And actually, uh, one of the things that we did after the first panel was we got some feedback on what had happened during the course of the discussion. And what people told us was that really what we're interested in is actions that we can make uh, to improve diversity in our community. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the survey that we did recently right at the end, uh, but one of the things that we do know is that the BMSG community, like much of the rest of the um, geoscience community uh, in the UK, is not diverse and that is not good enough. And what we're interested in is how to do better with that. So we've got some uh, fantastic speakers today selected because they're the sort of people who make a difference with diversity in the actions that they've taken in their careers to date. So I don't know if you can unblock your cameras just for a wee minute. Uh, here we go. So we have uh, Sean De Silva from Oregon State University. He's a, a volcanologist, uh, but he, you're actually uh, from the UK originally. So you're uh, 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 an expat Brit in America. Uh, Christopher Jackson, who's from Imperial College. He's the professor of basin stratigraphy, but is also known, of course, as Volcano Man for his exploits uh, in various volcanoes around the world. And then uh, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Mikhail Kamehu, Kamehu, who many of you might have met when she came over to the UK uh, as part of her PhD research in the, um, at the University of West Indies and spent some time um, at the University of Bristol. So we're going to start out with them talking, but I wonder, uh, the person who's really been helping me a lot with this has been Mike Cassidy, and he wants to tell us a little bit about who we are, because we've all got to sit with our cameras off in this uh, exciting world, uh, so it's kind of helpful for us to know who's in the room at the moment. Mike. Hi, um, just a really uh, brief word from me, just to say that uh, we've got kind of a really nice um, kind of mix of different people of different career stages um, which is quite nice so about 29% of, of the people attending or at least who signed up um, were permanent academic staff members um, but we also have a lot of early career people postdocs um, make up about 23% of our audience today uh, and also PhD students um, and also we've got quite a significant proportion of people who signed up um, from non-academic positions. So I thought it was quite a nice spread, um, but as Jenny already said, from our survey we did the last meeting, we're actually quite uh, uh, undiverse when it comes to, um, uh, you know, people of colour. So uh, that's something we're going to try and talk about today. Um, I think there's nothing else I wanted to say, um, so I'll just, I'll stop sharing and then I think that would be good. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Um, so, as you said, one of the things we want to focus on later is actions, but what we've first got to do is have some um, extreme inspiration, uh, no pressure there guys, um, from our three panellists about their experiences and the changes that they've um, enacted. Now what I'm just about to do now is drop into the chat is a link uh, to another, I hope it's the right Mentimeter one, somebody will tell me in a minute if it's the wrong one. Um, if what it is, is this is a link to Mentimeter, which we used in last time, for those of you who weren't here for the panel last time. The idea is that as the speakers are chatting, you're gonna be filled with inspiration and wonder and lots and lots of questions that you want to ask. So what you can do is pop your questions in there. But the other thing that helps us a little bit in terms of sifting through those questions is this is set up so that if you're particularly interested in a question that someone else has asked, you can endorse that by giving it a thumbs up. And then what we can do is during the question time is particularly prioritize questions that it feels like a lot of the audience are, are interested in because there's a lot of you here. And then after that, we are going to try and experiment with breakout groups where we're going to kind of really focus on actions hopefully drawing on some of the points that have been uh, made. 
Right, so it's time for me to shut up now because you haven't come to listen to me. Uh, what you have done is you've come to listen to our first speaker, it's Professor Shanda Silva, uh, who was a PI, PI for an increasing diversity in earth sciences project at Oregon State and also the LBS GeoBridges project. And uh, Shan has really kindly agreed to get up at 6 a.m and uh, come and talk to us uh, about uh, some of his findings from doing those research projects. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Jenny. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely perfect. Okay, great. So I've got a few slides here, and uh, what I'm gonna try and do is um, just quickly summarize some of our um, efforts uh, here. As you know, uh, the US has the same problems as uh, uh, Jenny was talking about in terms of the uh, diversity of the uh, sciences community and um, there have been many programs here over the last uh, few decades uh, trying to address diversity in STEM as a whole which is science, technology, engineering and maths and earth sciences fits into that and we've been um, uh, we've been trying to run some programs that uh, address this uh, issue of, uh, of diversity. So uh, let's see if I can share my screen here. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, so um, I'll assume everybody can see that. So there are two, two programs that uh, we've been working with, and um, there, one is uh, called Increasing Diversity in the um, Earth Sciences, or HIDES, and then the other is um, the GeoBridge program, which is an outgrowth of uh, HIDES, and it's a partnership between a community college and uh, Oregon State. And um, these partnerships have been uh, critical in terms of um, access to uh, diverse communities. And that's something I particularly want to uh, uh, emphasize here. Um, so, you know, why do, we, um, uh, why do we concern ourselves with uh, these type of programs? Um, it's a systemic problem uh, in the US and the UK and many other um, communities that there's a lack of representation. Uh, of underrepresented groups uh, in uh, technical fields. Um, and we know that this is not because um, this is a talent problem. Talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. So the key is to try and increase access uh, and opportunity to the underrepresented communities. And that really involves developing a pipeline uh, and this is where um, a lot of our efforts have gone, is to try and develop this pipeline into the geosciences community and um, earth sciences. So the, the goals of these projects, and I should say that, uh, you know, this is something that in the US has been going on for 30 or 40 years uh, at least, and uh, there was this article in um, in nature that you may have seen that there really has been very little progress, particularly in terms of ethnic diversity uh, in the earth sciences. And um, so one of the, uh, the main goals is to try and increase participation in the earth sciences by uh, underrepresented groups uh, and um, ethnic minorities in, in particular. Uh, and in doing so, you know, one of the hopes is that um, the underrepresented communities see the relevance of earth sciences to uh, their communities and by uh, by doing that you uh, expand the impact of the uh, of the earth sciences so uh, you know all of you are probably very familiar with the um, the barriers to entry into earth sciences uh, for um, different communities uh, and um, I won't go into that, that's something we can discuss if we want to, there's a big literature uh, on that. Uh, but in particular, um, academic programs in the US are concerned because of relatively low enrollments in earth sciences programs, and the concern about the potential health of the earth science uh, enterprise. It always comes down to a business uh, uh, issue. Um, 
And then, you know, there's a recognition that lost contributions from uh, these diverse cultures uh, and talents to the earth science enterprise and the recognition of the value of engaging some of the fastest growing groups of our uh, population. So there's a, um, there's a good understanding, I think, of uh, what we need to do. Um, and, you know, one of the recognitions is that you have to reach uh, communities, diverse communities, and then create a pipeline into the earth sciences career path. And uh, so the first stage of uh, our programs was uh, trying to develop this pipeline. Then you have to minimize leakage from the pipeline. There's a whole host of issues that um, result in people dropping out of uh, earth sciences uh, or, and uh, other technical fields. And uh, part of the challenge is to try and create a framework within which we minimize that uh, that liquid leakage and once once the pipeline is created then you have to provide access to networks and career paths and this is often an issue because it's often easy to get people into the pipeline but at the other end there aren't uh, often um, career opportunities or job opportunities commensurate with their uh, their qualifications so that's something that uh, really uh, is um, requires partnerships and um, collaborations at all different levels. So here's a, um, uh, a simple map of what uh, what we um, of the model that we have. Essentially, we have a, a recruitment um, piece, which is uh, you can see Oregon State uh, in there. Um, and then we partner with community colleges because particularly in Oregon, this is where the um, diverse, uh, diverse communities are, are represented much better than the four-year colleges like the Oregon State. So we have a partnership across the state with community colleges and then um, we recruit um, participants and they work within a um, essentially a mentoring framework. And this is uh, a key part of the uh, programs is that uh, mentoring is at the center of it and a research um, experience uh, is the core of this experience. And we also try and provide some um, uh, fundamental skills uh, like uh, GIS and so on, which are marketable skills that uh, the candidates and the participants can carry through um, their experience and um, so you know there's a summer GIS workshop there's a personal project with a mentor um, summer internship field trips uh, and and so on and this is all trying to build up the uh, skills which um, uh, which are often lacking in uh, the uh, experience that uh, students get at uh, community colleges and to make them feel more uh, at home in the geosciences environment at a uh, four-year college. Um, and then the hope is that that will lead to career pathways into either graduate schools or state and federal agencies uh, and so on. And this is where we try and partner with um, uh, alumni in the program and then various contacts that we have in uh, the uh, uh, the uh, career uh, network. So um, the way we design these programs is that uh, it's not just a summer program. Um, engagement for a long uh, period is uh, seems to be vital to keep people engaged and interested and so it's a two-year program um, and we recruit people in the second year of uh, most community colleges are two-year programs and then they transfer to a four-year uh, program um, and we try and recruit people at the end of their second year from the community college and so they spend a, a first summer in which they develop their research uh, relationships and start a research project. They're taught fundamental skills. 
they're taken on field trips, given sort of basic uh, field mapping skills and so on, and that sets them up for the rest of their geology academic uh, career. And the hope is that those skills will then translate through and help them, uh, enable them to succeed and minimize leakage uh, in, the, uh, in the program. Uh, and then, you know, we, we try and continue that process through to the second year. So there's a deep mentoring experience. There's um, uh, some ownership of a research project. And um, then the uh, participants feel that they are uh, involved in the uh, earth sciences uh, process. And, you know, we differentiate um, our programs from typical sort of uh, research experiences for undergraduates or REUs because we feel that this continuous engagement and the long-term relationship with a mentor is uh, is critical and that's uh, that's something that's been borne out by the outcomes of our projects. Um, who are our participants? Um, when we talk about diversity uh, in the in the U.S., um, there's uh, obviously many uh, different flavors of uh, diversity. Uh, we did try and focus on um, ethnic uh, diversity and cultural diversity, but uh, there's also um, uh, socially disadvantaged and economically disadvantaged um, communities that are also part. Uh, this program and and the the funding agencies do not allow us to uh, exclude um, particular groups based solely on uh, on race. But um, we had a good representation across many of the underrepresented communities in this uh, program. Um, I could show you statistics of how uh, um, how sort of homogenous Oregon is, and so our our goal was to exceed the uh, population um, demographics of uh, Oregon and we did that in spades. So we have uh, a good um, representation in terms of ethnic diversity but also uh, in terms of gender um, diversity as well. One of the keys to this is uh, ensuring that the participants have ownership and one of the you know big barriers in earth sciences, as you all know, is that um, often underrepresented communities do not see earth science as a um, uh, as a career path or as having any relevance to their uh, personal life. So we try to design these programs with the students' interests foremost. Um, they were interested in earth sciences when they applied. Um, but what we tried to do is find out what their interests were and then try and design experiences that would tailor to their interests. Sometimes things didn't work out and it, over the two years it gave people time to sort of move uh, into another area and, uh, and try that. But the, uh, the key here was that the experiences were personally relevant. Uh, and that gave time for a strong relationship to develop with a mentor and a research group. And it also gave the mentor um, the opportunity to try and tailor the experience to best assist uh, the students. And the research projects lead to senior theses, research publications, uh, presentations at professional meetings and so on. So the, the outcomes we hope for are that, you know, there's this, um, a tangible outcome at the end that the student can see um, as a result of their their experience. So some of the things that the participants uh, really uh, emphasized that they um, uh, they appreciated in the program was uh, this uh, the opportunity and the access to research and a um, and a network. This is something that most of the participants would not have um, had access to had they uh, remained in a traditional path and not been part of this experience. Um, most underrepresented communities aren't privileged to have the access to um, these kind of uh, research opportunities and um, uh, a network of um, researchers or mentors that can help them with their careers. So that was a key part of this whole thing. And, 
uh, I think it led to a lot of ownership and um, and uh, appreciation of uh, earth sciences as a career pathway. Um, the next was um, the development of fundamental and marketable skills, just simple things like um, uh, giving them extra training in um, the cognate sciences like physics, chemistry, and math that often are barriers to uh, completion of an earth science degree. Uh, and in particular, the GIS background, many of our participants ended up uh, in, um, in GIS career paths uh, as a result of this, uh, uh, this program. Um, the multi-year experience uh, was important because it allowed students to be engaged and um, not be distracted with having to work and so on. So we funded them for essentially two years of their, uh, their um, academic uh, time. Uh, and that's, this really allowed them to focus on the, um, uh, the uh, research project and the, um, uh, the work in the, in the program. The um, having funding also uh, allowed us to leverage the time and resources of mentors. Uh, if you put all the emphasis on the mentors, then that becomes uh, difficult. So uh, having program funding that um, uh, ease the uh, uh, the burden on the mentors that was uh, that was important, uh, and the cohort was important. We we essentially had four years, um, um, actually seven years of program, and each year we brought in a cohort from anywhere from ten to seven participants, and this cohort was an important part because there was a shared community with shared experiences, and this was an important part of them moving through the uh, geology program uh, successfully. Um, and the tailored experiences were important because uh, students felt that they had uh, some ownership of the program and peer mentoring. So uh, successive cohorts would mentor um, uh, the incoming cohorts. Um, some of the things that we learned in general that might be useful um, is that uh, this is really personnel intensive. It puts a big, um, uh, there's a big effort needed from uh, mentors and uh, people really need to be committed to this program. Um, but if a strong relationship de develops between the mentors and the participants, that seems to be uh, key. And part of that is the individual attention that the participants receive. It's something that they've never um, had before and they see that they belong in the earth sciences community and um, they see how they can contribute um, usefully in, uh, in the community. Uh, the multi-year experience was key to that because um, it allowed a, a deep uh, experience and a, and a strong relationship to, uh, to develop. One of the other things was that the enrollment um, uh, process and the vetting of applications um, has to be more creative than the traditional looking at grades and so on. We had a holistic vetting process that uh, looked at life experiences and backgrounds uh, as well as um, academic uh, qualifications as well. And then funding is critical. Without funding to um, ease the burden on um, the participants, uh, many uh, of these participants would have leaked out of the system because they have very non-traditional um, life pathways. So, um, you know, if, if we're going to do this type of work, um, some things that uh, we've learned through these programs is um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's lots of uh, research that has been done on what are the best practices and um, what, are the key, what are the keys to uh, trying to uh, increase diversity through the um, involvement of underrepresented groups. There's a huge literature out there. Um, you really need to understand the motivation and intent of the program. You know, why are you trying to um, do this? Uh, we all say that, yes, we want to increase diversity, 
but what is the motivation for doing that? And that really uh, is a key. Uh, you have to understand um, deeply um, what the motivation and intent of the program is. And then the program design has to really address the central issues. We talk about diversity, but diversity is a sort of bucket term that uh, covers many uh, different uh, flavors. And, uh, you know, you have to decide what we mean by diversity. Is it gender diversity or is it um, really cultural diversity? Um, and the program needs to be designed in order to uh, really address those central uh, issues. And then one of the biggest frustrations uh, with these kind of programs is sustainability. As soon as the, um, we, we obtain funding from um, federal funding agencies um, with the promise that the university would then pick up these programs once that funding um, has, uh, has been exhausted. And what we found is that uh, the universities uh, dropped the ball uh, because they're happy to have these programs as long as they're externally funded, but when it comes to internally funding them, that doesn't often um, meet their highest priority. And so sometimes great programs just die uh, on the vine. We've been fortunate that um, actually Oregon State has had a sort of 20, 25 year history of doing this work, but it's all uh, been through external uh, funding. And then, you know, if you're designing a program, uh, I think, you know, these are just common knowledge. What gets done is what gets measured. Um, so, you know, your goals need to be part of the fabric of the culture of the organization. So, you know, for BMSG, is uh, increasing diversity really a fabric of the culture? Is it um, part of the sort of foundation of the organization? And then, you know, what accountability, uh, accountability and measured uh, metrics and goals need to be very much part of any program that you um, that you uh, design. So I'm going to leave you with uh, just some of our uh, participants here, and thank you for your uh, attention. Thanks very much, Sean. That was really fantastic to see some um, actual evidence from a really long-lived program, seven years. Uh, pretty amazing. Uh, so it's really great for us to be able to hear about that and think about some of the things that uh, worked. Yes, wonderful. So I'm going to, we've got some questions showing up on Mentimeter, but what I'm going to do now is uh, move straight on uh, to um, Chris. So Professor Chris Jackson, who you might have seen uh, playing uh, opinion tennis with people on Twitter uh, with the fantastic news that he's going to be one of the Royal Institution Christmas lecturers uh, this year. He's a geoscientist at Imperial College and he's been involved in a really rich variety of university, national and international initiatives um, to improve uh, diversity. So uh, uh, without further ado, I'll let you take over the floor now, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you very much. Um, Hopefully you can all see my screen there. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to give a briefer and more personal take on some of the um, issues of race and racism in geosciences at the moment. And it's unashamedly drawn from my own experience because, you know, it's very difficult to talk about these things, but I think at least if I draw on my own experiences, they're authentic and, um, and I can recall them very well and, and um, give some experiential data. So you might not call that qualitative, but experiential data to some of the quantitative data. And I think, you know, I would be one of these people, as you can see here on the right, growing up in um, Derbyshire, I would have been one of the people who would have benefited from the types of programs outlined uh, just now by uh, Shanaka. Um, so, you know, how did I get from the, the little kid with the leather patches on his knees to liking rocks? So this is me and my brother when we were growing up in Derby. And like I said, it was an industrial town in the East Midlands, a very white part of the country in the uh, 70s and 80s. But I think one really important thing that will come out of this short talk and then, you know, something I feel very keen on is intersectionality. And that is the idea that things which might benefit one group, and in this case, let's say black people, may actually benefit a much broader group of people. In this case, based on where I grew up, um, is working class white people as well. 
you know, I grew up, to, um, you know, my parents, uh, my mum was from Jamaica, my dad was from St. Vincent, who sadly passed away, now that's my brother, and they are my real family, by the way, even though I'm kind of freakishly tall, but they were both nurses, so I, and my brother's still a postman, so I came from this very odd background of people who had no um, academic experience, but they had very real life experience in dealing with people, I'm possibly better at dealing with people in some ways than I am at science, but um, and that kind of came out of the background, I, I, the kind of environment I grew up in. My school is an important part of this story. I went to a community school called North Baker Community. You can see it's last Ofsted score there in 2018, got um, inadequate. Um, and it's in the lowest 7% or so of the um, GCSC average grades nationwide. So in inner city, white dominated school, there's five black children in a class of about 200. Uh, in my year group. So overall in the school, there was about 25 to 30 black people. Um, so growing up in a very white space, it's an interesting thing when you think about being black in academia or in STEM or in university systems, it's actually sometimes black people who have been around white people a lot are actually better at navigating those spaces because there's probably some coded behaviors and languages which are being picked up because you're a black person in those white spaces that allow you to then advance in a white dominated system like academia. I then kind of got exit velocity from Derby and ended up going to the University of Manchester. And Manchester was interesting, you know, through my school careers, overt racism was luckily minimal. And actually in Manchester, it was minimal as well because it was one of those places where if you were bright, you kind of were just accepted for who you were. And I guess I had a very poor awareness of the fact I was incredibly in a minority in Manchester, there was not many black students there at all, or that there was any prejudice against me at all. And that, again, is an important point I want to raise is that not all black people are the same. Um, so it's very important in some ways to kind of be aware of the spectrum of black experiences because, you know, my story will be very different to somebody else's story of how they felt being black at university, so passing through higher education. I had a, a net positive experience, and that might have been because of my kind of lack of self-awareness about the fact that some prejudices were out there and actually there were some discriminations against me. But you know, geology, I was in geoscience, you search geoscientist or geologist on the internet, a bunch of white guys to turn up in the field inevitably with the other hats on. Um, so it was a very white subject to be doing. I then left Manchester and ended up to a company called Norsk Hydro in Norway, which is exactly where I am now in Bergen in Western Norway. And again, that experience was really kind of great in a way, you know, being accepted and respected for the work you did, how hard you worked, and in you know, the Norwegian culture being as it was the fact that there was recognised the value of, diverse, of people being different and having different experiences. So um, again, a positive experience through the time I spent between my PhD and coming back into academia at Imperial College. And I'd say that's probably where things became more obvious to me. Okay, so my experience of 17 years at Imperial College has been overall good. It's been more challenging in the last six months, obviously. Um, but I would say that by being at the university and by being in academia, I came across more, not just black academics, but BAME or BIPOC or like broader demographics or like say just non-white people. Um, and I think it's through their stories actually that I have developed a much better understanding as a black person about the discriminations that are brought upon black people. So. Again, my experiences have been quite positive until very rel relatively recently, but I've learned a lot about um, some of the challenges by being in the university system. And I think some of those things are not particularly unique to the academic system um, because it's kind of, the academic system is set up in a way, as I've talked about over the last few days, in a very white male presenting sort of set of metrics. Um, but just, more broadly across society as well, you know, the, the hands on the wheels of society are from a relatively narrow demographic uh, group. What I'll say is, you know, even though you go to Imperial College and you get like awards and you get fancy trappings, you still can have these very painful experiences that remind you that you're black. And I just want to pick up on one story here, which is where I um, went to Stanford last year to give a talk at great expense to 
um, their department. And to cut a long story short, some very senior person in the university when I went there, when I went into the room to say hello and present myself before my talk, said, oh, so you're here for the PhD position, are you? And this was last year, I'm 43 now, I was 42 years old then. Uh, and I had to correct that person and tell them that I was actually here to give the invited department's seminar. Um, and it comes down to what I think is, um, you, know, you know, this kind of racism like that. And that's not to say the person who did that to me is racist, but I firmly believe they are not. But still there is a set of prejudices around the sort of person who would be coming to give a talk at a university like Stanford. And you can't get yourself out of that. So no matter how far you go on, you know, so you get things which are quite subtle all the way through to um, this Twitter quote here from when I was in um, Australia last year, you know, first day in Perth, you get called this. And, you know, although I don't like Kanye West, I think there is a good lyric in one of his songs, which actually sums up what it can be like to be black in academia. Even if you're in a Benz, you're still a nigger in a coop. And it's from a song called All Falls Down by Kanye West. And, and it's interesting because it basically says you can't educate yourself or you can't earn money, you're, you can't like get out of being black by educating yourself, you can't get out of being black by having money because there's a very reductionist way of looking at where black people should be and what they should be doing. And, and I think this speaks a lot to unconscious biases. You know, I ask people on this call, of which there are 50 or so, like think about how you respond when you see a black person walking towards you on the street or coming and standing up to give a talk or any of these situations. Why might this happen in the UK in academia? Well, you know, Bain professors on the left there account for about 11% of um, all the professors, and black professors, uh, it, so go for the B in Bain, going for black professors, it's 0.74% of all the professors in the UK are, um, are black. Depending on where you look at those numbers, you know, there's an article in The Guardian here where it said the universities employ about 40 million people. Uh, a couple of years ago, 33% of non-UK nationals, 2% are black, only 140, so 0.7% of those 21,000 professors are black. So you have, a, you, ha you, have a, you have a racial demographic like that in these higher education institutions. And it's no surprise that there is surprise when people come across black people in those spaces. Um, so I think these demographics kind of talk to why those biases arise. And it's not to give people a pass on not addressing them or tackling them, but, it's, but equally I'm trying to say, I can see where some of those come from, but it's still not good enough. You know, women are doing even worse at this. And this, I left this bullet point in to highlight this intersectional aspect is, imagine being a black woman, you know, I'm a black man and, you know, there's a hundred and, let me do my maths here, 115 black male professors in the UK. And in fact, there's two black geoscience professors in the UK. I'm one of them. Um, you know, so you have this very white sort of environment that we're operating in. And, you know, like this article captures, you know, universities are monolithically white places. Uh, I think it's hard to agree, disagree with that. You know, there's systemic problems, although random Twitter trolls tell me it's all fine. And Einstein was okay, is what they tell me. Um, and I just leave you with some quotes there. You know, like these things about, are you here to give this talk or a you know, colorblind version of racism? Um, whiteness dominates power structures and universities are currently not really getting their teeth into this issue of race racism in a serious fashion. I've actually put these slides together earlier this year, this, this particular slide, something else, before the murder of George Floyd and um, my experiences since the murder of George Floyd have made the hard in my view on, on this point. I think the appetite for taking on these problems is, is we're not going far enough and fast enough. So I'm really pleased to see the VMSG, which is, a, which is monolithically white, I think as Jenny said at the start almost, the fact that you, a white dominated society, are trying to do something to tackle this in a serious way is hugely encouraging as from a black perspective that it shows that there's people who are willing to spend time and effort to try and break down some of these barriers for, 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 for a group which is completely different to their own. And so that's it from me. You know, I, I do spend a lot of time around with people on Twitter and, and spending time talking about various things which aren't to do with rocks. Um, and I do it in the hope that, you know, in the future for my three daughters here are all mixed race. And so I'm kind of interested what their experience is going to be like, you know, so that when I'm an old man or an older man, they 
are entering, if they choose to, into academia in, a, in, a, in a, an environment which is far better and far more positive towards non-white people uh, than the one I presently find myself working in. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. That was uh, pretty inspiring. And it's, it's, it's really good, I think, to remind ourselves uh, that one of the main reasons to do this is to make things better. So we're all cooped up chatting to each other now, but hopefully over screens, but hopefully in the future, we're going to create something in universities when we all get back together that's better. And that's something I'd like to focus on with the breakout group. So thank you for that. So last, but absolutely by no means least, I've been um, contemplating uh, fangirling you by putting some links to your papers, Michal, into, <laughs> into the chat while you're talking, but I think it will distract people from your main message, but we'll do it. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome Michal Kamehu. Kamehu, why do I keep doing that? Sorry, who is a volcano petrologist at the University of the West Indies. And she came to the UK uh, on a scholarship where she uh, did some absolutely fantastic work on some of the volcanic rocks of um, uh, St. Vincent and Becquerel uh, uh, at uh, the University of Bristol. So thank you, Michal. Thanks, Jenny, for that lovely introduction. So, I just wanted to give you guys an idea of my experience as a PhD student, both in the Caribbean and in the UK. So I started off working at the University of the West Indies in the department responsible for monitoring volcanoes in the Eastern Caribbean. So naturally I wanted to pursue further research in this area. And my supervisor actually advertised a project to me in igneous petrology on some rocks in the Grenadines. So I decided to pursue that. And early on in my PhD, I actually encountered my first barrier to research. Um, and this was the accessibility to lab facilities for geochemical analyses. So my department only had one petrological microscope and nothing else. And there's nowhere else in the region where, where there were any um, geochemical equipment to help with my research. So, um, I figured out early on that I have to find some way to get to a place where they had these facilities to put in my research. So luckily, my supervisor, he has linkages with many institutions, not just in the UK, but for this talk in the UK. And I was able to utilize one of those linkages to go to Bristol in 2014 to analyze a couple of samples over two days, about eight samples over two days. So I went actually to do a course on electron probe microanalysis run by EMAS and I stayed on for two days extra just to do these analyses. Um, but obviously two days is not enough to complete a whole PhD. So I wasn't able to make any significant dent in my research, but the people who hosted me in Bristol, they said to me, you know, if you can find money to come back for a longer period of time, we will be willing to host you. So I said, okay, that's great. I would try my best to find some money. And I think the fact that they were able to offer this to me was testament to the relationship my supervisor had with his colleagues at Bristol. So when I went back home, I started looking for funding opportunities. And as many other international students will realize, there aren't many out there for people like us. Um, but my, one of my colleagues in Trinidad, he suggested I apply for a Commonwealth Spitzlight scholarship. So that would allow me to spend up to a year in a university in the UK and I'll have access to facilities and they'll pay tuition, accommodation, the living expenses. So really a great opportunity. So I applied and unfortunately the first time I applied, I was not successful. I didn't give up, I applied again, but it actually made me feel really hopeless because I didn't know how else I'd be able to get this PhD done. So I tried while waiting the second time to find out the result. If, if I could do other things at home to finish this PhD, I even considered doing another topic with facilities available at my home university. Um, but thankfully the second time I was successful. So I went to Bristol um, for one year, 2016 to 2017 academic year. So during my time at University of Bristol, I really, I did feel some inequalities at different levels. So the first level I would say is when I compared what I learned at my undergraduate geology degree in the Caribbean, compared to what UK students learn in their undergraduate degrees. It was a wide, a big disparity there. So I found myself having to play catch up just to get to the same level that everyone else was. 
Um, and this was also evident to my supervisors at Bristol. And I can remember um, my supervisor suggesting that I sit in on an Ignis Patrology course to audit it. But I really knew that they really meant, you know, just try and pick up on your skills because, you know, you don't know anything. But I was thankful at how diplomatic they were at making their suggestion, not to make me feel too bad at how little I knew. And so I'm grateful for all the supervision I received there. Um, and I really felt like my supervisors at Bristol were invested in making sure I did the best that I could. So that was really encouraging. Um, the second inequality I encountered was really the lack of diversity. So there were many people that looked like me in the department, but I was sort of used to this when I did my master's in London um, some years before. And I was used to being the only person that looked like me in a, in a class. So that wasn't a big um, issue for me. Um, being from the Caribbean, you would expect when you go to the UK, you would be the only person that looks like you. That was just my experience. So I was fine with that. But those two um, inequalities actually made me work much harder. Um, and just to catch up and prove myself. And in the end, it worked out well because I was able to finish my PhD with a good project. Um, and then, so my supervisors at Bristol were actually very encouraging, as I said before. So they actually encouraged me to join these departments or research groups. So I joined this patrology brunch group, I think that's what they call it. And they had these monthly or fortnightly meetings where you would come and listen to other people give, present their research. And there I was able to make some friends, meet peers in my field. And at one point I actually gave a presentation to that group. Um, also, my home supervisor in Trinidad, he had another colleague at Bristol, and he told her that I was there, and she actually invited me to join her weekly um, meetings that she had with her PhD students. So she would have these meetings at lunchtime where the students would come, eat lunch very informal, and discuss what they did over the past week, what problems they had, and everybody would discuss and give feedback. And that was a great way to make friends and also learn what other people were doing in the department. So generally, my experience at the University of Bristol um, really made, wasn't too bad. I got the education that I needed to make my PhD research much better, and I was able to meet new and exciting people. And it also made it easier for me to go to conferences. So the first time I went to a conference was in 2013. I went to IFC in Japan, and I went to present my master's research and some work I was doing in Trinidad. And it was very overwhelming. I mean, it was that's a really big conference and I really felt like I just wanted to remain invisible and just hopefully nobody asked me any questions at my posters because I didn't feel like if my research was on the same level as everyone else's. However, based on my experience in the UK, um, towards the end of my time at Bristol, I went to IFC in Portland. And this time, um, I really felt like if my research was on par with everyone else, so just based on the experience I had at Bristol. So I didn't feel um, major inequalities there, except for the obvious physical differences between me and everyone else. But in terms of what I learned and what I could present, I felt like basically um, my research was on the same level as everyone else's. So I think some key takeaways from my experience being a Caribbean student, um, spending some time in the UK, it's important to have good linkages between universities and institutions from the get-go. And this is a great way to encourage inclusion from less represented places in the world. Um, and it really helps if, the, if a student does an exchange like mine, if the overseas collaborators are supportive and encouraging, given, at least in my case, the shortcomings that the traveling person would have um, in terms of the latest technology ideas, research, it's good to have that encouragement to make you um, do the best that you can do. And then you will have these benefits to both the local and overseas territories. So you have this knowledge exchange, um, building human capacity, and then this inclusion of local partners within the international research community. And I just wanted to give you this example. It's just, it's not that people from the Caribbean or regions such as mine, we want handouts. I don't think that's the issue, I think if we are given the same opportunities as everyone else, we are quite capable of doing just as well as everyone else. Um, so I, I can give you the example of, when you look at research from my region, 
a lot of the publications that come out, first and second authors are not really Caribbean people. And this is largely due to the availability, the access to um, equipment and funding to do the type of research that is necessary. So I think opportunities like mine gives persons from my region the opportunity to publish as first or second authors and just give the representation needed to um, make it so that researchers actually come from my part of the world. Um, so I think I'll end by that, by seeing that. Um, that's just a brief idea of my experience as a UK exchange student. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, uh, Michal. That was a really great insight into some of the really key things. And it plays really nicely into what we're going to try and do with a little bit of time later on is to have some breakout groups to discuss some of the really positive ways that we as uh, uh, as Chris said, a predominantly white community can actually be better allies to try and help create that kind of equal uh, playing field um, later on. Uh, so I don't know, guys, if all of the panelists can maybe, I think what we'll do is we'll have five or ten minutes worth of um, questions. I don't know if, um, if you can maybe turn on your screens again. Uh, we have got a plethora of questions that have been um, uh, asked by uh, participants uh, using Mentimeter and I'm going to start with our uh, top voted question. Uh, you can go in any order that you like to answer this or pass it on to your fellow panellists uh, but this is something that really uh, people were very interested in at the last panel as well in, in thinking about. Uh, from your perspective how do you think, uh, how can you deal with denial uh, and try to encourage uh, in our broader community obviously the people who are here are, are interested in this issue, how can you uh, work to confront denial from colleagues that racism exists in geosciences? Do you have any kind of technique or anything that you've used that's been particularly um, effective with this? I'll, I'll say one thing, I think I've got two approaches. One is data, like pie charts, like Mike Cassidy likes. Um, is data, is try and bring them data because you think scientists or academics react to data. Oftentimes though it's very hard to come by data because it's not been collected in a systematic way and also sometimes the numbers around Bayan people are so small that it's easy to identify people so there's a hazard in those people reporting negative experiences. So then when you don't have enough data you can go to experiential data, you can say to them look this happened to me or speak to this person that happened to them if they're willing to talk to them. And then thirdly if they don't listen to quantitative or qualitative data, just give up on them and just spend your energy supporting that demographic directly and engaging with people who can be. Because I just think it's just a, it can be a thankless and very emotionally damaging task of when you know there's a problem and people denying it. I mean, what can you do? Yeah, I mean, I can uh, uh, add to that. Um, I, I would agree with the data. There's a, there's a big literature out there that you, know, you can introduce people to. Um, and conversations um, are critical. And I think, uh, you know, we're at a time when people want to talk about this uh, issue. Uh, and it's important to invite the people who are skeptics to these conversations. And uh, certainly uh, in the US, there's a big movement now to um, require particularly academics. And I think it's in the corporate culture as well to go through um, diversity training, if you like, and there are uh, lots of workshops and required uh, training courses and so on, just to try and um, educate people about the historic development of systemic um, biases and so on. Uh, and then this whole issue of, um, uh, you know, individual systemic bias and so on, that really helps people understand where they're coming from and maybe um, develop uh, some understanding for uh, other views about uh, these kind of issues. Mm. Yeah, I think, do, do you think that the this diversity training, do you see it in your academic lifetime as making a difference or? I think people are uh, more aware. I mean, I've been around longer than most of uh, you and, um, you know, it was interesting listening to Chris because uh, his story resonates uh, really well with uh, my personal experience. You know, when I was a, uh, a grad student in England, I think I was probably the only colored grad student in volcanology uh, for about five or 10 years uh, in 
in, and I remember going to VMSG and being the only brown face uh, there for many, many years. And so, but you know, I never felt the, uh, the kind of racism that uh, people talk about now. So his story really uh, resonated uh, with me. And then um, Mikhail's uh, um, emphasis on mentorship and, um, uh, and the network and the importance of uh, having um, strong mentors was, was critical. But um, uh, I think uh, what I'm seeing now is that uh, the training does uh, really open people's eyes. Um, some people are just completely unaware and just requiring people to do basic training. And, it, and it, uh, it's just like having to take safety mm. courses and so on, to work in labs and so on. And uh, I think it has opened up the conversation. I mean, there's still people who just in yeah. complete denial, but uh, okay. it, uh, it is an effort that is ongoing here. Okay, yeah. That's great. Uh, Michal, do you have anything you want to add to that at all about how you think um, you can change, difficult to change minds? Um, I guess it, it depends on the aspect of its science, but I mean, in terms of volcanology, you can just look at, you just have to open your eyes and look at the um, types of people that publish the, and they compare the people who are actually in the region monitoring the volcanoes and then look at the scientists that come to do to help um, improve to, to improve the reduce the risk by um, improving the hazard but all the publications most of them come from outside of the Caribbean region I'm just speaking from my region because that's my experience but if you just sit back and look at what's in front of you you can't deny what's already there yeah, yeah. okay Thanks, good. I think you, you guys are largely talking positively, which is really good. And I think one of the things that you've all mentioned is the value of strong and proper mentoring. Uh, so the next question really is, um, how do you think we as an academic community can actually reward those sorts of activities? Because I think probably having been good, having been mentored well and being good role models yourself, you understand how time consuming it is. And Sham mentioned that. How do you think we can try to move things around to stop kind of rewarding the ivory tower egotistical single and start really actually thinking about how to reward that type of activity, which clearly has a positive impact? Well, I think that's um, a key is sort of building it into the reward system. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the things that's happened in the last five years here is um, diversity related activities are now built into people's position descriptions and so in the annual reviews every year you know people have to talk about what they've been doing in terms of trying to enhance uh, diversity and inclusivity and equity and so on and you know still there are people who you know don't adhere to the um uh, the imperative but uh I think a lot of people are now embracing this and you know we're looking at it in terms of how to um, uh, recruit graduate students, how we do um, admissions uh, and how we evaluate applications and so on and there's there is a shift i mean it's 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 still a systemic uh, problem, but uh, I think there's an awareness of uh, how to try and address this. I think as well as there's, there's an issue as well as soon as you metricize something and make it a target to be good as soon as you incentivize if you're good you'll get this money or if you're good you'll get this promotion then I think you can start to pervert behaviors right so I think you end up just you know and I think somebody explained it to me the other day it's like um you know diversity within without inclusivity is hard the individual right so it's like the, the, you know and the, an easier way of putting that is the whole like diversity inclusion is like being asked to go to a party but not being asked to dance right so you're allowed in but then you're just put in the corner and then you get tokenistic sort of accusations leveled at you so i think we have to be really sensitive about how we we incentivize being not racist because i think some people who are racist will do anything to get ahead and i think Mikhail, you said the same thing about papers like people will just like go and 
fish around for some like local scientists to go on their paper so it looks better in a kind of very performative fashion to the outside world but materially they're just terrible people who don't really want to fully engage with those communities so and i don't know if i have i don't have the answer but i'm just saying it's a it's a thing to be cautious of yeah Michal, you? Um, well and i think what some of my experience wasn't really well, i didn't really feel overt racism per se i guess but i guess because i when i leave the caribbean and i go to the uk i expect to be different i guess that really relates to the underlying um those expectations really surely underlying racism i guess but i didn't really feel any overt racism but i think when you compare um uk or international overseas territories coming to do work in regions like ours um it's not always black versus white because in for example in, in, in the mvo most of the scientists uh a lot of the scientists are not black but because the collaboration comes between our um low-income part of the world as opposed to the first world countries you get that disparity there in terms of inclusion so it's not only mm -hmm. um minority race versus white it's also um high income versus low income countries yeah okay thank you it's it's a good point i think intersectionality has come a lot a lot i'm just keeping an eye on the time i'm going to ask one last question because somebody asked it so nicely and it's been thumbs up a few times which is they really want to know what you and the panel think about having ring fenced studentships or mentorships for um, underserved groups in the community do you think that is a good good idea something specifically ring fenced uh, for those groups that are currently underserved uh, by our research community and you yeah. can give a one word answer if you like <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah I mean, it's it's, cons it's completely within the, at least within UK law, it's permissible, right? And that's one thing people are often agitating about at the moment as to whether it's legal, and it is, mm -hmm. uh, as long as it's just addressing systemic and historical inequalities. So we should be thinking about it. There's also the thing that often comes back from that is there's a premise that it basically breaks down meritocratic fame frameworks. Mm -hmm. And the joke being that academia is not meritocratic, of course. So why would, and, and, and also, you know, because it's not really meritocratic and it measures opportunity rather than ability, I think, uh, Shanaka, you said that earlier on really beautifully. Yeah. You have a lot of mediocre people in positions and in positions of power. And actually, what we want to be thinking about at least is, you know, addressing that balance for the betterment of our discipline. Yeah. And if that means ring fencing, funding and, and giving opportunity to people without denying it to others i think that's a very powerful thing to do yeah i mean i i totally agree i mean our, our programs are very much ring fenced uh, and we do exclude through the um, vetting process certain groups but uh, there have been legal challenges but uh, generally um, those have not succeeded because it, it's felt that this is part of what we need to do in terms of uh, uh, equalizing the opportunities. Great, okay. Michal, what do you think? Um, I can just give you my experience about now looking to try to get into a postdoc. It's very difficult to, for me as an international student to get funding for any kind of postdoc anywhere in the world. Um, like most of the, like no funding is only for European and UK people. So I think if they can find some ways to expand those opportunities to people who are not from those parts of the world. And I think with COVID, maybe, um, and not just postdocs, I've been applying for jobs as well, and it's quite difficult, but with COVID, working remotely may help with getting teaching positions for anyone, not just um, people who live in the UK. Um, but I, I'm hoping that, after conversations like these, opportunities for research positions um, expand to include, well, it makes it easier for people like me to apply for them and get through for not just short term one year postdocs, because it's not very, um, doesn't make sense for me to leave my home just to go 
to the US, for example, for one year, but a longer two to three to three year position, that would really help people like me. Um, so I have one other thing, uh, Jenny. Do, does the VMSG group know about Involk? So when I was on the uh, executive committee of IAFC, we uh, established a program called uh, the International Network um, yes. of... Uh, and I can see Volk Karen, Collaboration. Karen was here today again. Um, oh, okay. So yes, we discussed, it. we discussed it at the last um, meeting. I didn't put links into the last write-up, but I tried to put some links into some resources and funding sources that might help with some of the issues that we discussed. So, so yeah, I mean, it goes straight to the issue that uh, Mikhail was talking about in terms of uh, access uh, to laboratories and uh, resources, not necessarily for postdocs, but certainly for um, short term analytical visits and things like that. Yeah, great. So uh, I'm receiving messages from the timekeepers in the VMSG committee. Um, and what we'd really like to do is actually try to, to translate this into some actions. So you can see um, I have put up another Mentimeter poll into the chat. And shortly what um, Janine is going to do by magic is we're all going to time travel into some uh, breakout groups. And what we would like you to do in those breakout groups is discuss exactly some of these things and they resonate with some of the questions that we were being asked as well, which is um, basically three ways in groups that you think are good ways to be an ally based on either your personal experience or things that you've heard in the two panels and three top tips for handling different opi difficult opinions. So they don't need to be something that you think, it's something that you talk about as a group. And I think what we're gonna do is swirl you off into groups um, for, uh, 10, um, uh, for 10 minutes, you'll get a sign when you come back. And what I want you to do is to write in the assigned group number that you have, your three top tips, so three ways to be an ally, three top tips, um, to be uh, and three top tips for uh, handling difficult opinions. Thank you very much, Mike. And then I've also put in a fun little ranking exercise, which is just drawing on some of the points that um, Michal, Chris and Shan made during their discussion, where you can assign 100 points. So if you get bored during your work at your group, you can move through that. Uh, you can assign 100 points to these different things to start thinking about priorities. Because obviously what we have to do as a community uh, by the end of three's discussions is come up with some tangible actions that we would like to do. Right, Janine, do you want to take it away and furrow people off into their breakout groups. Oh, fantastic. So there was, do feel free to turn your cameras on it now if you like. Uh, so there was a momentary panic uh, because it seemed that uh, on finishing the breakout groups, somehow we managed to throw you all out. <laughs> 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 and we're going to pull an air of mystery over that and you can maybe go to the YouTube court recording to find out who it was who's responsible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so really sorry about that guys. Uh, one of the things that I'm now going to do is just seamlessly have a little look at uh, some of the answers that we've got from the groups. Group one I have to say are fantastic. We're starting to see some responses. So while we're waiting for um, whatever uh, happened to unhappen, I am now going to, uh, let me just present that to myself and then oh, escape and then uh, share screen with you guys. Okay, here we go. So um, I don't, I suspect it was probably a little bit chaotic um, to start with um, what you were meant to be doing. So the idea was that while you were in the groups, you maybe have a bit of a discussion about three ways to be an ally and three top tips for handling um, difficult opinions. And um, so one of these uh, is group two, who said that support colleagues in meetings and when discussing issues. And I think that um, certainly from my own experience of dealing with gender issues, uh, that's something that's incredibly uh, powerful actually is when somebody speaks up uh, when they think you're being dealt with unfairly so and then also to um, challenge problematic views right let's see if I can uh, find any other groups who've added things group one were very active uh, they said to encourage uh, participation 
uh, to involve local scientists, um, refer people to the literature, but be uh, diplomatic and then uh, raise the issue of mentorship. And then I think possibly the instructions were slightly too chaotic for all the other groups. Um, so we don't have too many other opinions. But what we'll do post talk is we will um, send you the uh, link again uh, and um, uh, you can do that. And Sally has put into the chat group eight, huge challenge, virtual conference, text based presentations, interacting with schools. I've certainly learned a lot about interacting with schools. I don't know if just to close out if any of our panelists, if we haven't kicked you all out on <laughs> ceremoniously uh, at the end, uh, <laughs> would like to comment on some of the conversations that they were having, uh, reflecting through the experience that they brought early on to the panel. Uh, I can see Chris at the moment. I can't see, I can, and I can see Sean as well. And Michal is also here. Fantastic. I don't know. Michal, would you like to comment on the conversations you were having in your group? Um, we, one point that came up was um, in terms of dif handling difficult opinions, we were speaking about if you have a problem and you want to speak out on that problem, it's not always easy in case there are repercussions. Um, so you get negatively affected for saying something. And even if you want to make a complaint anonymously sometimes, if you're the only minority in that um, environment, it's easy to find out who the person that made the complaint is. So it's not always easy to handle difficult situations. Mm -hmm. You can't really complain about it effectively. Um, beyond yeah. that, I think Jasmine makes, made some notes which she'll share with you later. I can't remember most, all of it. Perfect. Um, I guess, I, Chris and, Chris and Sean, I, I guess from your experience, uh, the conversation in that group about the fact that um, we sh as good allies, we should speak out. Is that something that you find or have found to be particularly useful. Um, thinking obviously as uh, the VMSG community is a predominantly white community, um, do you want to pick your own battles or does it feel powerful uh, when um, uh, we speak out when we think something's happening that shouldn't be in terms of prejudice? I think it, I mean, I think it's hugely powerful, you know, again, relating it to the, the kind of experiences of this year when there was cases of racism in our departments and luckily it was COVID so we weren't physically in the same space the people who led the charge on tackling the management committee around those behaviors was a group of white people right and that was very reassuring for me to to see those people sort of taking up arms in a very very vocal and very well put together and very thoughtful and very sympathetic way to me they were like, do you want us to do this? How would you like us to do this? We're not intruding on something. Like, you know, they did it in an amazingly thoughtful way. And so I, I, think, I think it is inspiring to see um, people who aren't like you fighting on your behalf for other things which, you know. So, I, I, so don't, don't underestimate your own power in this, right? Mm -hmm. And you know this, Jenny, from writing this preprint about the, the Bain Black biases in geoscience recently, you know, there's a lot of concern amongst the authors on that list whether or not white people should even be writing this mm -hmm. group, writing this article, right? And, you know, there's a very interesting set of conversations around the fact that, in fact, it's really, really important for white people to be reading, talking, trying to put together. And there has been some missteps, as we've seen with some articles in recent times, where a dominantly white group has sort of made a bit of a mess of things. But I think it's, it's good that you, you're doing this. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll uh, echo what uh, Chris said. Um, there's also, you know, the, the power structure. Um, not everybody can, it feels comfortable addressing these issues. So you have to sort of look at your, your personal um, comfort zone and so on. But um, one of the things that came up uh, in our discussion was, um, you know, should we simply ignore the people who uh, we consider um, just uninterested or in denial uh, about these issues and I, I think this is where the conversations and having open conversations about this really uh, uh, come into play. I mean I think the more discussions you have and the more data-driven uh, discussions you have the more likely you are to sort of uh, try and change uh, some of the views of people. 
great. Just to add to the data, sorry, just to add to the data, I think the really important thing with data-driven approaches though, if you can get enough data, is to have a narrative around the data. Yeah. I think if you don't put a narrative around data, people will interpret those data. So we were just talking about this in our breakout room. You know, if you look at black criminality, black, you know, kind of questionable social behaviours, people just think it's because black people are terrible, but actually it has a very long historical link to deprivation, social deprivation, lack of access of opportunity, and, you know, slavery and colonialism. But people will interpret the data around, say, knife crime in London in the context of the individual and not the historical context. So always be prepared to have a narrative yeah. to explain the, the data you're putting forward. I think I, I mean I think you're dead right there, and you, we've got the communication on our side. So obviously, as a, as a group of volcanologists, we're quite familiar with the risk communication context. And a really strong example of the power of data plus narrative is obviously what happened with the A levels in the last couple of weeks, where there was all the data about what was going wrong and what was unfair about it. But the thing I think that made a difference was hearing these stories of the A-level students breaking their hearts about what was going on and how it was affecting their life trajectory. So I think that's a really powerful point actually about the data uh, combined um, with the narrative. So I'm aware that with this slight bonkersness uh, that happened there with the breakout groups, we're running a little bit over time. Um, if anyone's got a really pressing, awesome ally and awesome how to tackle difficult people um, uh, point we'd like to make, please do not feel inhibited from doing it. Just put your thumb up or your clapping hands on uh, to show us. But I think um, other than that, we will make sure that we send a slightly less bonkers link to you all to write down your notes about uh, the top tips that you had um, from the thing. But I'd like to uh, ask uh, our three panellists to sum up any kind of final reflections. And let's go to Michal first uh, for this time. Um, I think, well, based on my experience, it's a good example of what can go well if you are actively trying to um, have inclusion um, and for me everything worked out well I mean there were some challenges along the way but things worked out and I think if people from both ends try to pursue opportunities to improve diversity things will work out well and you can have um, scientists at the end of it who are able to give back to their own communities and also who can create linkages for their own students, I guess, in the future to um, propel this diversity within overseas territories. Thank you. Sean? Uh, yeah, I mean, this has been great uh, hearing uh, the uh, perspectives of uh, some of the younger colleagues here, particularly Michelle and, um, uh, and Chris. And, I'll just go back to the points I made at the end of my my uh, uh, presentation that, um, you know, if you want to do this, um, there's a deep literature out there that um, shows that, you know, there are best practices out there. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and you really need to understand the mot motivation and intent of what you want to do. Uh, you know, what are the issues? Um, if it's lack of diversity, what do we mean by diversity? Um, you know, once we answer that, then we can look at the root causes and solutions. You know, if it's gender, that requires a different strategy to cultural and ethnic uh, diversity. And then you need to think about the time frame as well. You know, systemic issues cannot be dealt with with a band-aid approach. And so you, you've got to be in it for the for the long game if you really want to make uh, make the change. Um, I, sustainability you know what happens after this generation or this group of people um uh you know move on is there a is there a pipeline of younger people that will take up the mantle and and, and uh, continue it and you know this issue of um uh, metricizing things yes there are problems doing that but what gets done is what gets measured usually. And so, you know, you need to build it into the foundation of the BMST organization. It needs to be fabric of the culture. And there needs to be some measures of accountability to see whether these programs um, are actually going to be meaningful uh, or not. And you've got to stay the course uh, through commitment and sponsorship. And, you know, when you get frustrated, you can't walk away. So there needs to be some real deep 
commitment into this. Thanks, John. And finally, Chris? Yeah, just two very quick points. One is read the preprint that I see Mike has posted in the chat. I think that gives you a good sense as to the huge issues to do with fame and black inclusion in geosciences in the UK. And there's some data and there's some narrative. And there's also one thing I'm always really keen to show people is some potential solutions. Often if you come with problems, people back away. But if you say there's these issues, but here's some things you could do to tackle it, people are more receptive to the problematic news you provide that you're giving them. And then the other quick thing is try and find your voice. You're already on this call, you know, you've shown your faces on this call as allies and, you know, you want to learn. And whether you can find your voice around the dinner table with, you know, granny and grandpa and, you know, and, and having those conversations at that local level or on social media, you know, liking tweets, retweeting, talking, expressing opinions. And we're all different. We all have different levels of comfort with what we're willing to say publicly. But try and engage in that, I think, is a really good, important message, is try and find your voice and try and use it in support and then that's helpful for the minority community but also it kind of inspires other people to speak up. That's it. Perfect. Inspiration is an absolutely uh, wonderful place to finish and re remembering that we're heterogeneous and that there's power in our heterogeneity I think is really great. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and get these uh, opinions that you all had in the breakout groups down. We will summarise this discussion again and then the final panel is going to be one where what we're going to do is work together to create some priorities for us as a community of things that we can do as an academic organisation community in the UK. So I want to personally thank the three panellists but I'd really like our President uh, Sally to uh, do the very final closing remarks. <laughs> okay, thanks Jenny. Yeah, that was a really great session and it would not have been possible with, without Chris and Sean and Mikhail. So a big, big thanks to, to you all indeed. And you know, this is really important to the BMSG community and it's great that so many people have joined us this afternoon. So th thanks very much everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.